English. I can see some people are just smiling. Um, thank you for everyone for coming here. We're going to start the lecture with a quick um, round of citation from Brother Sultan. And we'll just be a few minutes if you just bear with us. So I can work with the Brother Sultan. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم هل أتاك حديث غاشية وجوه يومئذ خاشعة عاملة ناصبة تصلى نارا حامية تسقى من عين آلية ليس لهم طعام إلا من ضريع لا يسمن ولا يغني من جوع وجوه يومئذ ناعمة لسعيها راضية في جنة عالية لا تسمع فيها لاغية فيها عين جارية فيها سر مرفوعة وأكواب موضوعة ونمارق مصفوفة وزرابي مبثوثة فلا ينظرون إلى الإبل كيف خلقت وإلى السماء كيف رفعت وإلى الجبال كيف نصبت وإلى الأرض كيف سطحت فذكر إنما أنت مذكر لست عليهم بمسيطر إلا من تولى وكفر فيعذبه الله العذاب الأكبر إن إلينا إيابهم ثم إن علينا حسابهم صدق الله العظيم On behalf of the Islamic Society, I would like to thank everyone for attending. Alhamdulillah, by the effort of a few brothers, tonight was made possible. Inshallah, I will forward a quick intro onto the subject so we have an understanding as to why we are gathered here today. The topic chosen today as part of the Islamic Society's ongoing Dawah efforts is Jesus from a Christian and Islamic perspective. Jesus, no doubt, is a historical figure. It is one of the main bodies that makes us Christians or Muslims. The belief of Jesus is a fundamental in Islam as it is in Christianity. In essence, we both believe in Jesus, however, it is in concept where we differ. Before I finally forward you on to our speakers, I would like to men make mention that if you came here today with a closed mind, you're most likely to leave without any benefit at all. So without further ado, I would like to introduce the first speaker. Kofi. Good afternoon everyone. Good afternoon. I am Kofi. I come all the way from East London. For me that means I needed a passport to get here. <laughs> I am going to talk to you about Jesus from a Christian perspective. Most of, or all of what I'm going to talk about, will come from the Bible. 
If I attempt to do anything otherwise, it will be giving you my own opinion. And believe me, there are loads of opinions out there. So I am just going to go straight in and speak to you plainly from the Bible. Is that okay? Good. To start with, I'd like to say this. A lot of people have it that Jesus is a historical figure. Some people say he's a prophet. Some people even tend to say he was a good man who walked the earth, did things. They're all right to some degree, but you see, half a truth does not make all the truth. Half a truth is a lie. And so, you go into the Bible and you see for yourself who Jesus is. I'm going to start reading from Matthew chapter chapter 16, and I'm going to ask this question because he asked his disciples this. And for, I know there's some Christians here, and you've probably read this before. I'm going to try and do this. This is going to be a miracle. I'm going to try and do this in 20 minutes. So that in itself is a miracle. Now listen to this. Matthew chapter 16. And this is what Jesus said. Who do men, verse 13, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, others say Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, said to them, thank you. Who do you say that I am? And this is what Peter said, one of his disciples. Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's where I'm going to start. What do Christians, what does the Bible say about Jesus? Needless to say, you've heard about his birth. His birth was unique. He was born of a virgin. That's unique. No one else in history has, has, has that ever happened to. Throughout his life, he performed miracles. He took disciples, trained them. He died. After three days, he rose from the dead. After approximately 40 days, he ascended into heaven. That's why today we do not have the tomb of Jesus. You will not find it anywhere. The Bible tells us that he ascended into heaven. Christians have that as their blessed hope because he is coming again. And we look to that. And so, when I talk about Jesus, when I look into the scriptures, and I look for Jesus, who do I see? I see what the Bible says about him. He is the beginning and the end. He's the Alpha and Omega. He's the Prince of Peace. He's the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. All this is in the Bible. He's the Wonderful Counselor. The Mighty God. He is my Redeemer, my Savior. Every Christian's redeemer, every Christian's savior, every Christian's restorer. He's my great physician. When he walked the earth, he healed people. That was Jesus. He gave arms to people who were poor. That was Jesus. Why is he so significant to Christians today? Why is he so significant to the world today? Because he is the Savior. Saving us from what? You see, to do that, you've got to go into Genesis. I don't have time to do that, but I'll just explain to you what. In Genesis, in our Bible, it tells us that man sinned. And because man sinned, man was tempted with sin. Sin separated man from God. It means, no matter what you did, you could not get rid of that sin. But Jesus came and took our sins. He died on the cross, 
took our sins, took our punishment, so that we would be set free from going through that punishment. In fact, what we're really saying here is, Jesus is a love gift from God to the world. One of the most famous of all verses in the whole Bible is John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes on him should not perish but have eternal life. That's where we stand. Another reason why Jesus is significant, and I'm coming to a close because I know our is going to come up here and tell us about where Jesus stands in the in Islam. One of the things Jesus did, which a lot of Christians probably don't even talk about that much, is the act of restoration. When man was put into the garden, God decided that the way it was in heaven would be the way it would be down here. And because man fell, that never happened. What Jesus did was come and say, I am instituting here the kingdom of God. He started off by reaching out and saying, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Throughout the scriptures you find it. Jesus didn't come to bring confusion. He didn't come to stop anything. He just came to say, I'm going to restore things and put them right. That's why I'm here. I love you so much. So I've come down to restore things and put them right. And anyone who believes on me, that that's what I've done, anyone who believes on me, that I've taken your sin, will share that eternity with me. That's what Christians believe. That's where we stand. Brother Abdul? It's up to you because it's up to you. I mean, you got, you got 20 minutes. Do you want me to finish or continue? Well, yeah, yeah, I'll finish. Um, okay. Just, I got 20 minutes. Yeah, 20 minutes. Yeah. So how old have you got? I still got 10 minutes. I've got 10 minutes. Oh, praise God. I want to bring something into this then because this is wonderful. 10 minutes. Why did not I talk that fast? <laughs> He says it's a bonus. Why is Jesus so important to the Christian? Now, you're going to have to delve into this a bit more to understand. You see, the Bible is split into two books, the old and the new. For those of you who know this, Christians always say this, that the Old Testament is the gospel. Gospel just means simply good news is the gospel concealed. The New Testament is the gospel revealed. Why is Jesus so important? Because throughout the Old Testament, the prophets, the law, which the Jewish people used to call the Torah, the prophetic books, and the poetic books, which make up the Old Testament, all pointed to someone coming, a Messiah coming, and that Messiah was Jesus. Incredible. They all pointed to him. For 4,000 years, they pointed to Jesus. Now what I'm going to do is, because I've got time, I'm going to go to the first book in the New Testament. Just to bring something out. This is what Christians, we, we love this. And I'm going to show you because I find that a lot of people dispute the New Testament, that they are all right with the old. But when it comes to Jesus, the old confirms the new. I'm just going to read something out to you here. This is Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. And behold, a virgin shall be, born, be with child and bear a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. The funny thing is, that was a quotation, or a quote, from Isaiah, who lived some 700 years before Christ was born. Now I want you to picture this, let's bring this into modern day. You're a prophet. You've got words of wisdom. You've got words from God, you hear from God. 
God tells you something about someone so specific that's going to happen in the year 2700. Am I right in saying that? Yep. That's exactly what happened to Isaiah. Now it's interesting because the same thing happened a thousand and eighty-nine years before Jesus was born. David walked. And we also have quotations from David in the Psalms talking, he talks and he, say, he says things in the Psalms and they come out in the New Testament proving that Jesus is the one we've been waiting for. So you see, when Christians stand up and they say, we love our Jesus, it's because we know that he's the one. We've got the facts, not just from hearsay. We've got it from documented evidence thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago. Matthew chapter 2. And they said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, that you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are not the least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Absolutely incredible, because that also was taken from an Old Testament prophet, prophet Micah, Micah chapter 5, verse 2. And if you go through the New Testament, all you see is Jesus being revealed out of the old into the new. Out of the old into the new. Who is Jesus to us? He's everything the Bible says about him. He's the Son of God. Again, just before I finish, is my time up? Just before I finish, who is he to me? Again, He's a saviour, not just of me, of the world. He's a redeemer. The beautiful thing is this. He's the soon and coming king to establish the kingdom of heaven. That's what the future holds. And he's saying, does anyone want to join me? You don't have to do anything. Just believe that what I've said to you is true. Do you want to join me? That's what he's saying. It's no big deal. We've complicated it. Christians complicate it too much. If you go through the Bible, that's all he's saying. Please, come and join me. Come and believe that I died for your sins. That's all he's saying. Thank you very much. Begin by praising God and we praise Him and seek His help and ask for His forgiveness. And we take refuge with the Creator from the evil of ourselves and from the evil consequences of our evil actions. Uh, whomsoever God guides, there is no one to misguide, and whomsoever God leaves to go astray, there is none to die. And I testify and bear witness that indeed nothing is worthy of worship except God alone. And I also testify that Muhammad is the messenger of God. If you read the Quran as a Christian, or rather if you read what the Quran says about Jesus, you will recognize some things and there are some things you will not recognize at all. In fact, in some ways, the Jesus that the Quran talks about seems to be almost a different type of person. For example, we find nothing about or we find nothing that we are familiar with in the Qur'an concerning the nativity story as it has been narrated in the Christian tradition. In fact, the Qur'an places Mary in the temple and she has been given and dedicated to the temple by her mother. And she has been looked after the priests of the temple and the high priest and the prophet of that time because 
every generation of the Bani Israel had with them a prophet. Every generation of the children of Israel had with them a prophet. The prophet at that time was the high priest. His name was Zachariah. <coughs> Zachariah and the priests were given charge of Mary. The Quran describes, and I suppose in this bit is familiar, how the angel Gabriel comes and announces to Mary. And of course, she is a person who has been living in the temple. She is not, she is shocked by the angel appearing who appears in the form of a man and she is and she says I take refuge with God from you and he says I am a messenger from God and I have come to announce to you the birth of a son she says how can I give birth to a son when no man has touched me so the angel says this is easy for God God only needs to say be and it is and God brings about what he wills if we examine this passage of the Qur'an, already it is telling us some important things. Firstly, Muslims believe in the Immaculate Conception, that Jesus was born of a virgin, that Mary was a virgin, no man touched her. However, important, importantly from the theological point of view here, is that Jesus is a creation of God and God uses this term in the Quran kul fayakun meaning kul means be in Arabic fayakun and that thing is God just needs to say be and it is this is how easy it is for God to do anything or to create anything so the word the whole universe itself is created by the word of God Jesus is also created by the Word of God. And this is the meaning of Jesus being God's Word. But this does not mean that He is anything different in esoteric terms from the rest of the creation. He is still a creature. He is still something that has been brought into existence by God's power. Still needing God, still depending upon God still being a limited, finite being, born of a woman. Whereas the Qur'an tells us very clearly, لَمْ يَلِدْ وَلَمْ يُلَدْ Concerning the Creator, He is one. قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ Say He is God, the alone. This verse of the Qur'an makes absolutely clear that God is not one of three. God is not, أَحَدْ in Arabic means one and alone. Not part of something else, not one of three or four or two or anything. Ahad means alone. Allah Samad means God is the one upon whom everything depends, but God depends upon nothing. Anything that has a need cannot be God. Lam Yalid, God is not born. So anything that is born, anything that has been born is not God. God is not born. No one gives birth to God. Walam Yulat, and God does not beget. God is not the Father. In Islam, God is not the Father. God does not have sons or daughters or children. Someone's son is a product of an intimate act that took place between a man and a wife. But as the Quran says, who is God's wife? That he has a son. God did not have intimate relations with anyone to give birth to a son. Because God is not the begetter, God is the creator. This is what makes God different from the creation. This is one of the reasons why we worship and glorify God. Because God is not suffering the limitations and the deficiencies and the shortcomings of the creation. There is nothing that can be likened unto God. Whatever you can visualize, whatever you can imagine, God is not like that. So therefore Jesus is created. And this is why the Quran says... He is a word. Jesus is the word of God. He is. But he is this word that God said be. Kun. And he was. And he was created miraculously in the womb of Mary. And then Allah tells us how Mary retires to a place in the east. It doesn't say the name of this place. But she is under the palm tree. And she is giving birth to Jesus. 
And she is in agony and she is suffering. And she says, oh, was it that I was not born before this day? This is the pain of childbirth. And God tells her to gently shake the tree. And she eats of the dates and cools herself from a stream that is flowing nearby. And then she returns to the temple. And of course, the priests in the temple, they say, Mary, what is this? You are not an unchaste person. Your father, were, your, your parents were not bad people. What is this child? And she points to Jesus. And Jesus speaks. This is the miracle, Jesus, that he speaks. And he says that I am Jesus, a prophet of God and a slave of God. This is very important. He calls himself Abdullah, the servant of God, the worshipper of God. Jesus, like Moses, like Abraham, like Muhammad, prays to God. He calls upon God. He begs God. He needs God. Something that needs God cannot be equal with God. Something that is a servant of God cannot be God. This is what the Quran is emphasizing. And peace is upon me. The day that I was born, the day that I die, and the day that I will be raised up again. Now, <clears throat> The Qur'an tells some other things, some of them we are familiar with, that Jesus did miracles, He healed the lepers, He gave sight to the blind, even He raised the dead through God's permission. Yet the doing of miracles does not mean that Jesus is divine. Other prophets did miracles. Moses parted the Red Sea. The staff of Elijah also bring, brought people back from death. But it didn't mean that they were divine. These miracles are from God. It is the power of God working through His prophets. And these miracles are proof. They are proofs of the prophethood. They are proofs that these people are aided and helped by God. So Jesus also, He does miracles. And He is surrounded also by disciples. <clears throat> now, one of the most radical ways in which the Qur'an departs from traditional Christian theology is on the issue of the crucifixion. And I have to say, when I first became Muslim, even though I had read the Qur'an and I was convinced that it was from God, one of the most difficult things for me to accept was the crucifixion. Or, in fact, the lack of crucifixion. Because the Qur'an says that Jesus was not crucified and He was not killed. But in fact, God raised Jesus up to Himself. Now it's very interesting that just recently, only two weeks ago, I was doing some research and I came across something very fascinating. And this goes a little bit back to something that Kofi was talking about and it's very important, I think, in our dialogue is that Kofi has based, as many Christians, and of course indeed Muslims do, based what he said upon the Bible. But the Qur'an itself questions the veracity of the Bible. The Qur'an itself calls into question whether the whole Bible altogether is something that could be really completely trusted. In fact, it says that the people before have changed and corrupted their scriptures. And it was interesting in my research, I came across an epistle of Peter that is not included in the Bible today. But in fact, the early church, and this is the early 200 years after the time of Jesus, they actually wanted to include this epistle in the original text. But it was not included because actually what we find is that what today is considered to be the New Testament are selected documents. They were selected by a particular theological viewpoint. It's interesting anyway that the epistle of Peter actually says exactly what the Quran says. It says that Jesus was not crucified, nor was he killed, but God raised him up to himself. But then after that, our differences begin to reconcile themselves again because one of the things that Muslims believe as Christians also believe is that Jesus will come again 
Muslims believe that now Jesus is with God. He is in a state where he is in al barzakh There is a barrier between him and us. So like any person who has departed this world, we don't believe that he can hear us or communicate with us or that he could hear our prayers. But he will return. And this is also what Muslims believe. That Jesus will return. And Jesus will establish justice upon this earth. And Jesus will rule according to God's law on this earth. And the kingdom of God, the rule of God, God's true religion will become manifest to all people. And he will come and he will fight the Antichrist, who is a liar, a person who will claim that he is the Lord. But of course, that is not true. And although he will do amazing things, he will fool many people, Jesus will come to fight him and destroy his falsehood. And Muslims believe that at this time when Jesus is on this earth, the truth will become clear and that it will be a time of great peace and great happiness that even as the, the Prophet Muhammad said, that the lion will lie down next to the deer and the wolf will lie next to the sheep and the baby will play with the snake. And it means that this is the time of peace that will be upon the earth. So this is, very briefly, uh, some of the things that Muslims believe about who we believe to be a great prophet of God, born of the Virgin Mary, and that is Jesus, as we call him, Jesus, the son of Mary. Thank you very much. Thank you to the speakers. I'm sure they did a great job. We'll now be taking um, questions from the floors. Um, there will be paper being passed around, so if you could just get ready to... Um, ask some questions. If anyone has a question, however, they would like to ask voice to voice, if you could just stand up and I'll just choose some people, inshallah. word Christ is not in the Bible. Christ is not a title, it's the Christ. See, the Christ means the anointed one, the one who was sent. So you see, Christ isn't Jesus' surname. I don't know if you get what I'm saying. I, um, I read to you Matthew chapter 16, and Peter answered the question. He said, you are the Christ. So, as a title, it is in the Bible. Jesus is in the Bible. It's riddled right through the New Testament. The name Jesus is in the Bible. Before, before we take any further questions, um, can I request um, a few of the gentlemen here to fill up the front seats first, and there's people standing behind. So if I can ask a few brothers here to fill up these seats, there's some empty seats here. Um, same with the sisters, if there's any empty seats in between, please fill them up. I think we get in a bit of a queue at the back. I have two questions. I have two questions on paper, so I'll just ask them while people are formulating the questions. Um, this question goes to Pastor Coffey. Um, the question says, how does the Bible describe Jesus' prayer? For example, on Mount Seminar when he was praying, could you please describe that? Um, you mean when he was praying on Mount... The Garden of Gethsemane. Oh, in the Garden of Gethsemane. Or was it on... <coughs> you said Mount... I think it's before. You know the, uh, when the Oh, you mean when he departs from his disciples? I don't know who asked the question, but I need clarity on that one because he did pray in a lot of places. Yeah, he was where, he from his disciples. where he departed from his disciples and went to pray on his own. Matthew, Matthew, yeah. Matthew. So 
So again, Matthew 26. Open it. Oh, I get you. It's just before he he was crucified for his crucifixion. And the question is. The question is, how does the Bible describe Jesus' prayer? Okay. The Bible describes it, describes it as intense. And the reason it was intense was because, remember, Jesus came as man. <coughs> Again, Christians believe that Jesus is the Son of God. But he came as man. He was going to take on something that was totally different from anything else anyone had ever taken on. And that was the sin of the whole world. And so, he went to pray. And if you read the prayer, I can read it to you if you want me to, but if you read it, you will find that Jesus says, if it be, if it be your will, let this cup pass me by. No, you, you see, it's not so much frightened from death. Can I, I'll explain this a bit more to you. You see, when man fell in the garden, when man fell, our Bible tells us that when Adam fell, it says, this is what happened. Don't eat this fruit. From the day, from the day you eat that fruit, you are surely going to die. Man ate the fruit. Man was still living. What happened? You see, spiritual death is totally different from physical death. Spiritual death is a separation from God. So in spirit, man is dead. You're the living dead. You're walking around. You're separated from God. Your spirit is cut off from God. What Jesus did was take our sin. The moment he took our sin, he brought us back to God. He paid the price for us. It means that when Jesus was praying, he was not praying that he was going to die and he was scared. He was praying because he would be separated from God, because he was taking on the sin of the world. That's why he was in so much torment. That's why he did not want to go through with that. And when he did go through with it, on the cross, I know my brother Abdul here says that the crucifixion is debatable, but Christians do believe that he did die on the cross. And this, the, the, what we have in the Bible concerning that is that on the cross, he did mention, did say, my Lord, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because you see, God cannot look at sin. So that's what happened then. On the cross, that's what happened. He went through that for us. That's the important thing. That's where Christians stand. We're saying this is a... He didn't have to, but he went through it. Does that answer your question? It depends on what you want in the question because... Um, I think I think it's it's let's try a little bit to keep everything moving, yeah, um, and let's try to create a dialogue, hopefully, of understanding. I, I I was really hoping that everyone would not come with books with quotations which they're going to throw at everybody. Um, you know, we can do that. I can do that very, if, I, if you want me, you know, we can. But I specifically said to the brothers, I don't want to debate today. I don't want to debate. You know, we need a dialogue where we hopefully can try at least to understand. I'm not accusing you of doing that, brother, but, you know. Um, yeah. But, you know, it could go on a long time. So, let's try and keep things moving. 
Um, I did want to respond to what the lady said. Unfortunately, she left. Um, it's a bit of a shame. Um, however, two things. First of all, I forgot to mention a very important part uh, of what the Quran says about the crucifixion. The, cru the Quran does say that it appeared to them as if this had happened. So the Quran recognizes that whatever happened, it seemed, certainly people seemed that, it seemed as if Jesus had been crucified. Certainly the Quran recognizes that there is a reason for people to believe that Jesus was crucified. Now this epistle of Peter, okay, actually mentions that one of Jesus' disciples actually took his place. He substituted the place of Jesus. There were other Christian, you know, I, when I say Christian, I mean in the, in the very broadest sense of the word, people who believed in Jesus as either a prophet or the Messiah in their own way. And this is before the times of Islam. Um, some of them believe that Judas Iscariot was actually made by God to resemble Jesus and he was crucified as a type of punishment because of his treachery. These are early Christian groups believe this. This is pre-Islam. The Quran mentions that the issue of the crucifixion is controversial. It's something that the Christians don't agree about. Which, although you may think is not true today, in the time when the Quran was being revealed, it was the reality. There were many, many different ideas about who Jesus was, about what happened to him, and so on and so forth. And as the Reverend, she quoted Josephus, actually a more detailed examination of Josephus would reveal that like all ancient scriptures, unfortunately they were subject to a lot of revision, rewriting and distortion because they were copied by hand. They weren't printed like they were today. It's very easy for the copyist to put in things that would agree with their own particular ideas. Now interestingly, we don't have any ancient documents of the writings of Josephus contemporaneous to his time. In fact, there are very different documents. Not all the writings of Josephus, not all the copies mention the crucifixion. Some of them mention about Jesus and don't mention the crucifixion. Some copies mention the crucifixion and many historians have theorized that this was actually added later. This was actually added later by Christian copyists. This is the problem. One of the problems with dealing with ancient documents is these type of things. So, um, anyway, the point being, even the Quran acknowledges that people believe that Jesus was crucified. Okay? Um, the fact is, however, what the Quran says is that is not what happened although it, it appeared as if it had. So I just wanted to make that important point. I, I just want to make a point here. The point is, see, Josephus was not a Christian. I'm not in any way trying to belittle what my brother said. He wasn't a Christian. And what he wrote down, what he wrote was a bit like someone today writing something about what's happening in the world today and someone stumbling over it, over it in about 500 years. So Josephus was a very independent person. He wrote about various things. It would be wrong for someone to go in there and just change that little bit about the crucifixion. I don't believe that happened because he spoke about the wars that happened in those times, the Greek wars and everything. He's, he's accredited as one of the, the historians. So it's not so much, we, jo, Josephus is not, he's just one of the things you add on if you're going to make an argument for the crucifixion. But the one point I want to make is this Bible is authentic. But Abdul said that um, it wasn't. But that even some believers believe that it isn't. But that's not true, it is authentic. I just want to make a point that that is authentic. I haven't got the time to go into how I can prove it now that it is, but I haven't got the time. Let's go through it. Thank you very much.
Um, I'd like to make a note that if you could please ask questions also to Brother Abdulrahim Green because most of the questions I have here are actually directed to Pastor Kofi <laughs> and most of them are off topic. Actually there was about two questions um, referred to Brother Green and one of them was off topic. Okay, to Brother Green and Kofi, for most people, even Christians, the Trinity does not make sense. Please explain the Trinity. This is a very difficult subject, so um, instead of being extensive, if you could keep it as a, as a minimum, please. Okay, he <laughs> said, so, no, I don't want to push your doctrine. <laughs> the Trinity is probably one of the trickiest things. Even Christians, I will tell you, do not understand it. It's one of the trickiest. But at the moment, we've agreed that we won't go into quotations. And we're going to keep this as simple as possible. God is one. And I'm going to try and put this to you the way it is. If you look at the human constitution, this is as quickly as I'm going to do this. The human constitution is a body, a spirit, and a soul. I don't know if you guys believe in that. I don't know if it's not the in that. The spirit, body, and soul. But you see, you're one, aren't you? You can't separate that really, can you? If you leave this body, even though you've left, you still, you still need a body to live in at some point. And that's why even with Christians, we believe that if you leave this body, you will have a resurrected body one day. I don't know if that's so in Islam. In the same way, we see God as a three-in-one God. And the Bible, our authority, talks about this. In other words, we're sitting here today, I'm here, God's Spirit lives within me. I know some of you are shaking your head and you can't take this in. But that's revelation. That's revelation. When Jesus Christ died on the cross and resurrected, he said, I am going, but I have to go and stay with the Father. If I don't go, the Holy Spirit will not be allowed to come down. I won't come down. I have to go and let him come down. And that's what's happening now. And on Pentecost Day, and this again is documented, it's not just in the Bible, people witnessed the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Unfortunately, I, as I said, I can't go through the quotations with a brief, but if you go through the Old Testament, which I know, even if you won't dispute the New Testament, you won't dispute the Old. You won't dispute the Torah. You will find it in there. But I know you will argue, you will talk about it and say, no, it's not true. We as Christians accept it and know it by revelation. Of course, the uh, issue of the Trinity is, is something that the Qur'an itself is concerned with. And it is mentioned in the Qur'an very clearly. <clears throat> and the Qur'an says, do not say three, do not say Trinity, your God is one God. Um, and it is very clear in the Quran also that uh, it states that whoever claims that anyone, including Jesus, <coughs> is God, they have not believed in God. They have, in fact, rejected the oneness of God. The notion that some human being, that some creature, that some finite, temporary, Thing in this universe could possibly be equal to the infinite eternal creator of the heavens and the earth is the very doctrine that the prophets had been resisting since the beginning of time in fact from the Muslim perspective the message of all the prophets was to remind the people that God was not like any created thing and that if we look at the world that the prophets were facing, they were facing always people who were claiming that some human being was equal to God, or that had some of God's powers or God's attributes, or some creature, whether it was Osiris, Baal, Mithra, Alexander the Great, Caesar, Pharaoh, all of these people, either mythical or real people, were claimants to divinity. They all claim to be God, 
Alexander the Great, for example, claimed to be the begotten son of Zeus. So this idea of God begetting children, of man-gods, of human beings being God at the same time, this was the paganism that the prophets were constantly fighting against. They were upholding the pure monotheism that there is no... Okay, I have one qu um, Anyone from the audience? Um, I'll take your sister's question, if the lady in the green could just... appreciate the question now this is up to the speaker if he accepts the question yes, uh, I'm, I'm because the topics that actually pertain to Christ, Jesus yes, it's in context of Christ being the Son of God. okay so if there's different versions and how you prove something's actually changed okay. okay thank you um correction I didn't say mine is the only Bible I said as Christians this is our authority I said the Bible is our authority Okay, now I'll explain to you why there are so many different versions of the English Bible. Now, I don't know about, most people here probably come from a different country, not England. And you'll notice that you've got a very rich language. Very rich language. My parents come from Ghana. I speak Shi. It's an Ashanti language. It's very, very rich when they translated the Bible into Ashanti, it stayed that way to this day. English language is very rigid. I, I read the Quran from time to time, and there's one thing I've noticed about it. I read the Quran and I notice that they've left out some, of, some words that they've been saying. You read a sentence, and sometimes it's like you're reading broken English. And what I've noticed is, they haven't put in words to help understand the sentence. So I have grown to understand that if I read it that way, this is what it means. So I can understand what you're saying. You're saying that the Quran has been kept that way. Because the English language is very, very rigid, it is, what they do is, they, they, when they're translating it, they put words in to help understand the verse. Now, if you get yourself Let's say New King James Bible, it will show you, most of the modern Bibles will show you that where they put words in, it's in a different format or it's in a different print to help understand that this was just put in there so that the sentence will make sense. So I've got a Bible at home, a different version of the Bible, same English, but it's taken out all those little words that are in there. So it, it reads like broken English. I don't know if you get what I'm saying. So there are so many different versions of the Bible, modern English versions, but all these versions go back to the same source. I want to talk about, quickly, about the authenticity of the Bible. First thing is this, these books written in there have been taken and put in there by God. People don't believe that, because the Bible talks about itself. The reason we can say that boldly is because as Brother Abdul said over here, the, the, the Gospel of Peter, the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Judas, the Gospel of this, they've all come up in the first hundred years of the Bible, of the church. There were so many letters written that it got confusing. But the original ones that were written, Mar Matthew, Mark, those were two key ones that were written very early. And those have been added in here. But people or well, the authentic ones are the ones that have been put in. I don't care what comes afterwards. I'll tell you why I don't. Because if I worry about what's been coming in afterwards and what people have discovered and unearthed, it could be from anywhere. This Bible has got the power. And I'm not saying this version. 
I have a Greek Bible at home. I have a Hebrew Bible at home. I do my study. I work through the Bible. And I have chased. I was not born a Christian. I have chased the New Testament trying to figure out why it's authentic. That's why when I started talking about Jesus, I went from the new to the old. I said, this is what it says about Jesus in the old. This is what it says in the law about Jesus. Moses turned around in Deuteronomy 18.15. He said, listen, I want you to listen to me. God is going to send a prophet just like me. It's him you listen to. That was Jesus. Again, in Acts chapter 3, verse 20. Sorry, I'm using quotations. Same thing. Same quotation. Funny enough, the book of Acts wasn't, wasn't written by Hebrew. It was written by a Gentile, a Greek. Look. But I don't know if that answers your question. No, I'm just wondering, isn't it a bit like Chinese whispers then that something keeps getting changed around from language to Okay, I'll come to that afterwards because I think we've got so many questions that'll come to that. I'm sorry, you're going to have to sit down because I did say uh, the question right now has to be directed to the other people. Oh, I'll make just one exception. Yeah. <laughs> Prophets who came before Jesus and before Prophet Muhammad, all you believe on them. So if you take the example of Noah, uh, he was uh, like uh, when his his uh, when his followers did not follow what he taught them. So uh, God sent the flags and destroyed them all except those who believe. Then at the time of like the Prophet Yunus, he was in the stomach of well, but God saved him. And same and, ma and the same is true with many of them. So how can you believe that like God cannot save his own son from crucifixion? Okay, a quick question is yes. if God has a son, why can't he save his own son from crucif crucifixion? Thank you very much. No, it's not good. <laughs> it can only be a one part question, I'm very sorry. I brother, I have so much. Please, please, deal with me, please. Why why God has to when he has saved his prophets, why he has to uh, which question would you like? The first one would be that. Okay, I'm going to request the speakers to give um, two lines. Um, I'll give. Um, if the question was initially directed to Baba Abdul Rahim Green, and um, you can make a comment to a shot. Okay, now this is the truth. This is the honest truth. God could save Jesus. He could have saved him if he wanted to. But you see, as I said, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. What God did, see, our sin could not be, be cleansed by any animal. Nothing could cleanse that sin. For years, thousands of years, people were sacrificing animals. The Jews did it. Other, other religions did it. But you see, the only thing that can wipe away the sin of man is if man made a sacrifice, but there was no one pure enough. That's why Jesus was born. Jesus was born as a man, but you see, with purity, without sin. He had to be a lamb without sin to be sacrificed, to pay the price, so that we do not go through eternal damnation. Okay, brothers and sisters, I have to tell you, this meeting is going exactly the way I didn't want it to go. I'll be honest, um, I don't like these type of things for the reason is that they just end up being a type of pointless point scoring exercise. So why don't we just pick up our chairs and start beating each other up and, you know, get it over and done with, you know? Come on, guys. I, I, you know what, I've got a suggestion. Let's try and think different. Look, Christians and Muslims have some differences that are so big, we are not going to even begin to touch upon dealing with these differences in a meeting like this. I mean, I've been sitting here, what Kofi said, I would really love to respond to it. Okay, in detail. You know, but I'm holding myself back because I didn't want 
this event to turn into a type of Muslim, Christian, you know, boxing, you know, verbal boxing match, all right? Because if you want to see those, you can go, you can get the Zakir Naik debates, you can get the Ahmed Didat debates, you can get them all on tape, you can see plenty of those, and these people have dealt with it, bigger scholars than me and Kofi dealt with it better, so I've got, I got a suggestion. Let me see who can ask a question here yeah, to both me and Kofi about what solutions do Muslims and Christians have for the problems that are facing the world today. That would be nice. How can we work together? We've got differences, we ain't going to sort it out tonight. But you know what? The world around us is falling to bits. Yeah? The world around us is falling to bits. People are starving, people are dying. People are being murdered, people are being killed, people are being tortured in the name of Islam and the name of Jesus. Yes, George Bush calls himself a born-again Christian. You know, Osama is killing people, women and children in the name of Islam and Al-Qaeda. Okay, this is what people are doing in the name of religion. And there are people there leaving religion, leaving it, because they say all you people do is cause more bloodshed and warfare. And our world is being destroyed, being polluted, the environment is being... I've got a question for Kofi, yeah? What does your belief in Jesus, how is your belief in Jesus going to help make the world a better place? There's my question for Kofi. There you go. Okay, I've got good news and bad news. <laughs> so it depends on which one you want. All right, I'll give you the bad news. It's going to get worse. The reason it's going to get worse is because we're living in the end times. These are the end days. The Bible tells us <clears throat> that because lawlessness is going to increase, the love of man is going to grow cold. Today, Canada, one of the places where it had the safest cities in the world, is now having a crime. There's a crime blitz in Canada, New Zealand, everywhere you go. I listen to the news on the net all the time. Everywhere you go, crime is on the increase. Earthquakes. I was following, I was talking to Hamza about this. What was, it about, what was it three or four days ago? We were talking about this? I've, I've just done the statistics. Earthquakes are on the increase. Why? These are the end times. Wars, you would think, after all we've been through as a people, it will stop. No. That's the bad news. The good news is, from a Christian perspective, Jesus says, when you hear these things, don't worry about it. Because as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the Son of Man. These things are going to continue, they're going to increase, and then Jesus is going to return. So from a Christian perspective, Christians are really looking forward to Christ, and we're saying, yes, let's go, Father, let's go. But while this is happening, we're doing everything to solve these things. Because we know that he says, these things are going to happen. So we've got to look at this and say, Lord, you know, you said it's going to happen. But let's just pray more people into your kingdom. It's, there's a sense of agency in the church of God today. There's a sense that something has to be done. But what has to be done? Because we know we can't do it in our own strength. That's the sense of agency. So that is the good news and the bad news. But that's from a Christian perspective. No matter how much money we throw, into our communities. No matter what, it will just transfer to another community because these are the end times. Well, you know, my res what I would like to say is that actually the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said the first of the signs of the last day is my coming. Uh, so the last Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the first of the signs of the last days. And actually the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that uh, between my coming and the end of the world and he was sitting and the sun was about to set. He said between my coming and the last days, the end of the world is like the time between this sun and its setting. Meaning all the Prophet is saying is close. However, it is really not the, in the teachings of Islam that we sit and just wait for the last days to come 
and wait for Jesus to come as we believe Jesus is going to come or wait for the Mahdi to come absolutely not because it's been 1400 years okay and it's been 2000 years okay since Jesus was saying it's going to happen and it's been 2000 years 1400 years since the Prophet Muhammad said it's going to happen and we're still here Okay, the last days could be another thousand years or another two thousand years. Okay, yes, maybe things are getting worse, but I believe Islam teaches us to be optimistic. I believe Islam is a religion where we work to try and achieve goodness. We don't allow, because at the end of the day, you see I wrote to my friend today. He said, come over to Houston, Texas to give us some lectures. Well, you know, apart from my fear of being dragged off to Guantanamo Bay, <laughs> you know, and uh, apart from my sheer nervousness these days of going anywhere outside the United Kingdom, um, I, I'm actually genuinely, genuinely concerned about my carbon footprint. A long-haul flight produces enough carbon emissions for a human being if you divide it the carbon emissions that we should be allowed to emit. It's called our footprint. The average person in the West emits the pollution, what they would say is how many planets would we need in order to maintain your lifestyle? Most of us, if everyone in the planet lived like us, we would need three and a half planets in order for every human being to live like you and me. Now I believe that God is going to ask me on the day of judgment how I behaved. I believe God is going to ask me about every single little thing that I have done. I believe in a religion that teaches people not just to believe in some magic solution, you believe in this guy, he died for you and that's it, you can do whatever you like because you're saved. No. I believe in being responsible. And I'm not saying, because when Kofi talks about Christianity, I just came from Ireland. I just came from Ireland. And most Christians are Catholics, actually, until today, about, I don't know, 60%. And when I was talking with the priest, and our dialogue today seems so different, because really, believe me, when I heard the priest talking, I thought he was talking about my religion. And when I was talking, he thought I was talking about his religion. And what we agreed is that there are so many things we have to tackle as Christians and as Muslims. The environment, social injustice. Do you as Christians think it's right for people to suffer tyranny and oppression? Do you think it's right that we in the, you know, this part of the world enslave the rest of the world through debt, through interest payments? You think that's right? Don't you think we have a responsibility to do something about it? Or is it we just wait? You know, this is my question. Do you think we're just going to wait for Jesus to come and sort it all out? Or should we do something about it right now? Maybe we won't change it, but at least it means before God, we've tried to do something. It's my question. I mean, maybe I've interpreted everything wrong. But when Kofi sits there saying it's going to get worse and Jesus is going to come and that's it. I, what I'm asking is, is there something really practical, practical that we can do? I'm not saying that Christianity, I thought it did. So I was a bit confused by what Kofi said. I, I don't think we just sit and wait for Okay, for one minute, I've got to say this. I didn't say we sit down and do nothing. What I said okay, was... tell us what we do then. What tell I did say what was, yes, we do something, but we look forward to the return of Jesus. That's what I said. I said, you see, there's some prophecies that Jesus made that because it's a prophecy, you can't do anything about. You're going to come against God? No. You can't do anything about those prophecies. You can't. We don't know why. Let me ask you something, guys. 40 years ago, did you ever think, if some of you are not 40, some of us are. I'm showing my age. Did you ever think that communism will break down? Did you ever think about global warming? No. I reckon that there are things coming today that we don't tomorrow that we don't even know about. But all these things are things that are going to contribute to what is going to happen in the very near future. The book of Revelation in our Bible spells that out. The great tribulation is coming. But Abdul talked about the Antichrist. He's knocking on the door. This is everything. Everything is being primed.
for him. I'm not saying we sit there and do anything, and do nothing. I'm saying we look forward to what Jesus Christ is going to do. He's coming. He's coming and he's saying, listen, these things are going to happen. What we've got to do is do everything we can, but just put that at the back of our mind that he's coming. And these are signs of the time. That's what it is. Thank you once again. I'd like to commend both the speakers because what they just said recently makes much sense to me. I'm sure it did everyone else. And I want to ask a question off, off the paper and then I'll go back to the audience. And once again, I'd like to remind the speakers if you could keep it short and short. For Mr. Green, what does Islam say about the concept that Jesus took the sins of all the people? Does it mean that now the people of this world are free to do sins as they will and will not be accountable for that? And <clears throat> what does Islam say about this? See, <clears throat> I think there is a principle you have to observe in dialogue, which it's been difficult to do today. And the principle is, is that you shouldn't ask me to comment about the theology of Kofi. Yeah? I mean, I can take Islam's perspective. You know, our perspective is quite simple. Everybody is accountable for their own sins. So if you want to ask, what is the position of sin in Islam? Well, I'll answer that question. I'm not going to explain, you know, Christian theology or even counter it, but I will tell you, what do we believe? We believe that everybody is individually responsible for their sin. Adam was responsible for what he did. Eve was responsible for what she did. They repented to God. God forgave them. However, their action had a consequence. And the consequence of their action was they were expelled from paradise. And they were put on this earth. And the rest of the descendants of Adam and Eve, all of us sitting here today, we live on this earth. And we're going to be here for a time. And God is going to ask us about what we have done. Now we believe as Muslims that the way to get God's forgiveness is by number one, believing in God, not making partners with God. But when we have done something wrong, that we number one, acknowledge the sins that we have committed. So we acknowledge that I've done something wrong. Secondly, I feel bad about it. I feel remorse. I feel regret. Thirdly, I ask God truly from my heart to forgive me for the wrong things that I have done. Then also I commit myself sincerely not to do that evil thing again. If I have done something in addition that is harming another person, because some sins are between me and God, some sins involve harming other people. If I've harmed somebody else, I have to do my best to try and make that wrong thing right. If I stole from someone, I have to give it back to them. If I backbit someone, I have to say nice things about them, like I said bad things. Or even I could ask that person to forgive me for what they have done. That's justice because it's not just me and God now, you've hurt someone else. So you have to try and get that other person's forgiveness. This, by the way, I have to mention, is why murder is one of the most severe sins. Because when you've taken someone's life, how are you going to ask them to forgive you for that? So this is how we believe the sins are forgiven. We don't believe that God cannot look upon man's sin. It's in fact almost, I won't say the opposite, but it's almost the opposite. In fact, we believe as Muslims that God created us. Our nature is that we make mistakes, we disobey God. But it's in this process, you see, where we commit sins. And then we ask God to forgive us for our sins, and God forgives us. That's how we have a personal relationship with God. That's how we come to know that God is so merciful. That whatever you do, if your sins are as big as the heavens and the earth, and you come to God truly, sincerely, God will forgive you. And you feel the burden of that sin being lifted from you. So in our idea, there is no need for anyone to die for the sins. And also we don't believe God would punish me and you for what Adam and Eve did. That was their sin. They get, they get the consequence of that. You and me, we have to face what we have done. We believe every child is born sinless. Sinless. Naturally wanting to worship God. It's only our environment that takes us away from that. So this is our perspective on the issue of sin and repentance.
than you want. <laughs> is it written anywhere in the Bible, Jesus is God from priest? I assume it's from the chaplaincy because I don't see any priests here. And I assume it's aimed at coffee. So if you could please keep it short also. Now, it's written about two or three times explicitly that Jesus is God in the Bible. I can give you quotations, Isaiah chapter 9 verse 7, or you can even go to John chapter 10 verse 30, anytime you want, that it's written explicitly, because Christians do believe that Jesus is God. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, can I take a question from the gentleman in the shirt there? Um, we are living at a time where the rule of God Almighty is not uh, predominant on the earth, where the rule of a religion or uh, something which is revealed from God what does not have any uh, um, does not have anything to do with parliament or any type of constitution that legislates. Can you tell us what, uh, from a Christian perspective, what uh, um, the clerics or those who are at high rank in the Christian faith, what they think of this? Should Christianity have something to do with parliament and should it have some kind of uh, effect on the legislation which takes place in Parliament, and also the same thing from a Muslim perspective. So does God have the right to rule, and should we implement by God's rule on earth? And will this make a difference to our planet? Thank you very much. Okay. Well, um, the question is, does religion incorporate politics? And this question is asked of both speakers. Um, of course, Islam uh, has a very clearly defined system of life that includes modes of behavior, uh, laws, rules, regulations that we believe are from God. And this law that is from God is a blessing. It is not like it is mentioned, for example, that the law is a curse? No. This is not what we believe at all. The law of God is based upon God's perfect and complete knowledge of the human being. The happiest life you could ever live is when you follow God's laws. Because God created us, He knows us better than we know ourselves. So if we were only to follow that guidance and those laws that are from God, the human condition would be so, so much better. Of course, human beings are imperfect. God's law is perfect. So we cannot really expect that there will be complete perfection because there are always the mistakes and the errors of the human beings. But what we can say is that if we were to follow God's guidance, then our life would be the best that it could be in this life. The perfect life, of course, only ultimately is going to be in the life to come. Uh, so yes, definitely, I think that if we followed God's guidance and God's laws, uh, the world would be a lot better place. I, am, I'll agree, I do agree with what he says, that if we follow God's guidance and God's laws, the world would be a better place. But seeing that we're talking about Jesus, and I'm not even disputing this, I earlier on said that when Jesus came on the scene he was to establish a kingdom that's what he brought he says your kingdom come even in the Christian's Lord's Prayer it's our Father who art in heaven hallowed be the name that kingdom come you see he's here to establish a government he's here to establish God's laws he's here to, to imprint them on your hearts that's what he wants to do and if we would follow that then I agree, we won't have any problems at all. I'm going to read a question of the slip. It says, this is for Brother Coffee. Why did God sacrifice his son for our sins? Couldn't he just forgive our sins just like that? Okay, this is going to be another tricky one. I'm going to try and keep it short. You see, again, going back to the garden, obviously, 
I just heard, and I didn't even know this, that in Islam, you, every man's sin is their sin. But you see, in Christianity, because Adam and Eve sinned, all their fruit and everything that came out was tainted with sin. That's what Christians believe. That's what our Bible teaches us. And the reason, and our evidence is this. You lock a kid in a room. Don't bring the kid out, don't do it. They will definitely do something wrong. And you wouldn't have to force them. Why? Because they're tainted with sin. The original sin. Christians believe in the original sin. That sin could have been forgiven like this. But it has to be forgiven by blood. There has to be a sacrifice. The Bible tells us that sin can only be taken by blood and the blood of purity. Now, some of you are thinking, that's off key. But I don't think so. Because if you can believe that the Lord will let a virgin have a baby, then you also have to believe in the divinity of what happens. These are divine things. They're way beyond us. The Lord said it. He says there's some things that are so beyond us. And so there had to be a sacrifice. There had to be a sacrifice, a pure sacrifice. And that pure sacrifice could only be from God. Because no one was pure enough. Everyone born was born of sin. But Jesus wasn't. Because he was born of a virgin. That's why. Thank you very much. I have also had some questions here. Uh, before I take you, I'll just ask the audience, is there any non-Muslims that would like to ask a question? Yeah. Relating to the topic. Yes, Actually, what I just want to ask is, looking at the Islam and Christian perspective, looks like they all place a very high esteem on Jesus Christ. Just like uh, 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 I don't know, oh, Brother Abdul said, he said they believe that Jesus Christ is going to come back to rule under God's rule. Doesn't that give us an idea how different the Lord Jesus is? Who's the question directed Like he said, Jesus Christ is the word. Uh, it's one of God's word. Christians believe that even Jesus Christ was there before creation. He was the word. That is why he's still the one God is going to use to call to who. So when Jesus Christ says, I am the word. Okay. And it's through this same word he says, let there be light and there was light. Okay, that's a very nice question. The answer from the Muslim perspective is not something you can answer in two minutes, but I'm going to try to keep it short. Okay, we believe the version of Jesus, the version of who is Jesus, what is Jesus? Jesus, we believe, is the Messiah. But what we mean and understand by Messiah is not what Christians understand by Messiah. Muslims believe that the 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 prophets had prophesied of the coming of the Messiah. But if anyway, generally, and Christian theologians acknowledge this also, that the Jews believed that Jesus was a Messiah who was going to come and liberate them from the rule of the disbelievers. The Romans, the Byzanta, the Romans, the Babylonians, the Egyptians had enslaved them. The Romans had occupied the Holy Land. They had even desecrated the temple. The Messiah was going to come and establish God's law upon the earth. Okay? So this is what he was going. They believed in, you could say, a political Messiah. A person who was going to establish a physical, real kingdom of God. Okay? And that he was a prophet of God. We believe Jesus was that Messiah. And that's what the prophets prophesied about this coming of this person. In one translation of the Bible, for example, it, it is mentioned, not the kingdom of God, it is called the imperial rule of God. The imperial rule of God. Meaning that it is going to be God's law established, as we were talking about before. Now, the Jews, it is interesting, laugh at Christians because they say, that Jesus the Messiah was crucified. For them that is a contradiction in terms. It is impossible that the, the Messiah could be crucified. And Paul admits this. 
Paul says in his, in his epistle that the crucifixion is a stumbling block for the Jews. Why? Because the idea that God's chosen Messiah could be crucified contradicts everything that they were expecting from the Messiah. Okay? The reason why Jesus is going to come again, the reason why he was rescued, is because the Jews were proved obstinate and rebellious and refused to accept that Jesus was the Messiah. Okay, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, by and large, they rejected. Some accepted him. So this was a test, a type of test for them. But God's prophecies must come true. What God said is going to happen is going to happen. And that's why Jesus is going to come again. And he will establish the imperial rule, the kingdom of God on earth. And he will rule God's earth according to the law of God. That's why it has to be that Jesus comes because he has to fulfill those prophecies that were given to the prophets before. Yeah? This is our perspective on it. We're taking the last question, and it's going to be from this gentleman. It's not so much a question. Pope Bart said it would be useful. Christians believe in the Trinity because they believe <coughs> that there is a relationship in God. Um, three persons, each fully God. I think the other wonderful thing about Christianity is that Jesus said, uh, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. And there's, in God, there's service, which, you know, it puts, I think Christianity turns upside down all our notions of what's important in life. And we think it's, the higher up you go, the more important you are. But somewhere in divinity, there is service. Jesus came to serve. He washed the disciples' feet. And it also, you know, I think that's the wonderful thing about Christianity, that you so don't have to be Well, I suppose my question was, why Muslims, why, what? Why do they think God made man? If he doesn't need anyone, why did he make man? Now this is an up to the if yeah. he answers because it's off the topic, but it's mm. up to him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I just spent two days in Ireland, and that was the topic, what's the purpose of life? And believe me, it was amazing. The, the Catholic priests who talked it's as if we were saying we were reading. It's as if we were reading from the same pages. It was it was amazing. It was really made my heart warm to see how much ultimately we had to connect us together, and that was a very beautiful thing. And um, I, I think the purpose, you know, it's very clear from the Quran. The purpose of life is to worship God. It is to serve God. It is to come close to God. It is to try to do everything in our life in a way that God loves and God is pleased with. Some of those things are to do with how do we worship God. But the broad term, the broad concept of worship includes, of course, serving one's fellow human beings. And if we look at some of the very important things in Islam, for example, like zakat, for example, giving of charity, the charity that we have to give, um, how Islam emphasizes respect for the parents, kindness to the neighbors, Again, we would find so many echoes. Uh, almost the words are almost the same. About Jesus says, "Love." You know, the, the summary of the law of the prophets is, "Love your Lord, your God, with all your heart, and love your neighbor as yourself." And the and the prophet Muhammad sallallahu he said almost exactly the same thing about how we should be good to our neighbors, how we should. But I mean, Islam ultimately is more practical. It's more in the. I don't say more necessarily, but. It's more defined. It, it, it doesn't just say be good to your neighbors. It says this is how you should be good to your neighbors. It's, it really details everything a little bit more rather than a general, which is fine. You know, the general thing is good. But Islam says, you know, do this and do that and actually very detailed things about how we should treat others. Okay. Um, resisting oppression and tyranny and injustice and helping the weak and the poor and the orphans and the needy and these are things mentioned again and again and again in the Quran so the whole concept of helping humanity, serving humanity is a very very strong theme in Islam and it's part of what it means to worship God. Would you like to say something?
just just quickly, I just want to say, I just want to add to to what Brother Abdul says here. But the thing is, Christianity does detail things as well. I just wanted to make that correction. Christianity does not just say general. We detail a lot of things. We've got a Bible here that's 66 books long. It's I know the Quran has how many chapters? 114. We've got 66 books long, and some of our books are big. We've got it details a lot of stuff in there. How to treat everyone? How to? It's all in the Bible. So I just thought I'd say that as well. Just to add. I just make that choice as well. I'd like to thank everyone for coming and I'd like to remind before you all leave that there are some literature which is freely available to you just over to my right. There's also drinks and refreshments, so please do help yourself. And um, Okay, for the brothers that want to pray Asr, if you just wait, remain for a little while and we will do Asr. I'd just like to make a quick appeal. We as an Islamic society, we're looking to fund some orphans. Now, Islam is based on five pillars. One of the pillars is not to have fallen, and that is the pillar of charity. Unfortunately, we're not doing our half on it. So the brothers at the Islamic society have formulated a plan in which we sponsor as much kids, six ideally. In Sudan, you have over two million children who are displaced, homeless, with no fathers and no mothers. We in the West, we have the opportunity and the capabilities not only to feed ourselves, but also to feed others. I'd like, like everyone to think about this daily and sincerely. This is not appeal for the brothers of the Islamic society. In the Quran it says, That the life of this world is nothing but material deception. Yet we cling so tightly to this world. And the Quran it also makes mention that no matter how much money that you spend, you will always be reimbursed. So we should not think as misers, or we should not think that we should keep our money in our pockets. This is a noble cause. We may not be able to save two million children in Sudan, but we can try at least and say that we tried. Now it takes 300 pounds to sponsor a child. And I'm sure everyone will agree that this is a noble cause. Now already prior to this event, two children have been sponsored. That's 600 pounds before the event has even started. Now I would like to make a request, a really sincere request. I know you are all, we are all students, but whatever money that you can give, can you please donate it? There will be brothers on this side collecting money, and if you want, you can leave your name and telephone number, and if you want to make a bigger sum, then leave, we will contact you. It's better that your right hand does not see what your left hand does. So it doesn't have to be done on the spot. I'm not going to ask anyone to stand up and donate and say give 300 pounds. This is not a good way. Rather, please leave your contact and we'll get back to you. And the money does not go to us and it'll be very transparent. You can actually see where the money will go. And please keep it with you as it is children. It's the children of the future. It is our sons, our daughters, our brothers and our sisters. So please, please donate generously as Muslims and Christians and humanists. Jazakallah khair. Jazakallah khair. Jazakallah khair. Just a quick um, announcement. For all the uh, gentlemen and brothers, refreshments are available there. Uh, you can donate whatever funds you want um, there as well. And there's uh, literature and CDs available for purchase there. Uh, in regards to sisters and ladies, you have your own facility there as well. Um, there's refreshments, plenty of refreshments available. Donations can be provided to sister there as well. And uh, there's plenty of literature available. If anyone has any inquiries or if anyone wants to join the Islamic Society, an active member of the Islamic Society next year, please come and contact me or contact Kala Hamza. We'd love to have you on board, inshallah. Um, you know, we've been really, really busy this, this semester. And we'd like to have more of you on board, inshallah. So if anyone wants to join the Islamic Society, please